Richard Coots from Backer Architects. Thank you very much for joining us at ACCO on Air. Um, we're here at Vision London and you've been taking part in various uh, seminars and uh, talking about water and architecture. Is that right? That's correct. We've been talking today um, about innovation, uh, in particular what architects and urban designers can potentially do to mitigate the effects of flooding. And as we, well, everybody knows that the prevalence of uh, flooding either through climate change or changes in weather pattern is, is a common occurrence to everybody and, and how do we deal with that volume of water safely? And it's something that backup architects have made a, a sort of speciality of. Well, absolutely, during the last five years or so we started off with some very theoretical projects. Unfortunately that, that's received industry recognition. So um, initially uh, we developed the LIFE project for DEFRA. Uh, LIFE project stands for Long Term Initiatives for Flood Risk Environments, which was very much a, a thesis in terms of how we can plan environments to make space for water and then ultimately that, that's led on to innovations in the built environment so today we may well talk about the amphibious house. We'd like to, I'd like to come on to that very shortly but a little bit more about the background if I may uh, with backup because we see you um, reference quite commonly when we're talking about things like SUDS or when we talk about flooding on the Somerset uh, levels, um, these sorts of things, we see you in the news. So. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that's come about or, or, or what particular um, accreditation you have to do that? Because I think there's something linked with Reba. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, through our research work, I think we've now, we're the only architect that's won the President's Research Medal twice for, for innovation. And it's been going about a, a decade now. Um, but equally, our work and our approach, it's very holistic. So, we work very closely with engineers, we work very closely with landscape architects and as an architect and urban designer we're very transparent in the way that we work and through those synergies with different industries we've generated some very innovative ways to deal with, with flooding and that approach has been recognised in Holland, it's been recognised in, in France and some of that research guidance that we've developed has even percolated across to uh, Victoria in Australia where our diagrams are being used as best practice in, in planning guidance. So you mentioned the Somerset levels. Uh, during that period we were called upon by the RBA who passed our details on to, to Downing Street. And we were involved in briefing the COBRA team uh, in advancement of, of ministers making their press statements you know, live on air and also with a number of other industry specialists from Holland to give our professional view on what potentially could be the solutions in those areas. So, uh, unquestionable qualification there. It's very and, kind. Um, it, it sort of moves us on very nicely to, to the amphibious house, but um, we also, in the same breath, could be talking about flood resilient housing. Now, are they the same thing? Are they different things? Are they when you get a site, first thing you need to deal with is what is the potential flood risk. And when anybody buys a house, one of the first things they can do, if they live in England, can type into the Environment Agency website their postcode, and it will tell you the likelihood of flooding. And that is determined by some very simple diagrams. And those diagrams will tell you different flood zones and link to where your site is. So flood zone one, the Environment Agency generally say you're, you can build there. Flood zone two is a little bit more risky, so it's more likely to flood. Flood zone three is the functional floodplain. So in the same way we have the green belt, if you consider that the blue belt, it's the area around a river that needs to swell or to grow. And that's when we see the news, many of the houses that you see are located within flood zone three or flood zone right. two. Yes. Now depending on that classification, there are different ways to build a building. So the easiest way is to elevate the building. Now if you do that, and you build that upon land, you need to compensate elsewhere by digging a hole. Now the Environment Agency aren't very keen on that because it disturbs the, the landscape, disturbs the environment. So there's more intelligent solutions. So the next option is to elevate a building so the water can flow below. But at certain, in certain areas, because you need to raise the ground floor above a certain height, it's almost a story. So you've designed a building which is elevated, which is waiting for a flood event that might happen once in 50 years or 100 years. Yes, yes. So that relationship with the streetscape is, is sort of diminished. So there's a tipping point by which we say if it's above more than half a metre, 
there might be another technology. And in that scenario, you then move on to an amphibious house, which gives you the benefit of having your ground floor near the ground plane. But in the time of a flood, the house, uh, with its buoyant foundation, can rise very much like a boat and keep the building safe from harm's way. So we're talking about the amphibious house now? Yes. A buoyant house? No, absolutely. And coincidentally, I just you know have um, a model here of that house. So to all intents and purposes, and, and this is designed in a conservation area, it looks very much like your normal domestic dwelling. Um, here is the River Thames, and our building is set about eight metres from, from the river. And that's a, a, oh, it's close. It's close. And that's a natural buffer zone which is preserved by the rivers and, and the environment agency where really one shouldn't build a property here. So essentially our house sits on the ground. Now the house consists of several elements. We've got the lower element which is the wet dock. And this is like sheet piling. So if you think about our historical docks, uh, the Royal Docks here in London, yeah. or the, Royal, uh, sorry, uh, the Albert Dock uh, yes. up in Liverpool, yes. Or if you go as far north to, to Scotland, uh, Canton Basin, or, or, or all the, the basins, or all the docks around the River Clyde. So it's sheet piling that retains the ground around it. And this works very much like a drain. So the water percolates into here and then back into the river. The house itself consists of a can float foundation. And that is very much like the hull of a ship. So it becomes buoyant by displacing more water than its mass through Archimedes' principle. And then on top of that, we have a traditional build. And that sits within its wet dock. So there's no restrictions on the, the build above the platform. It's a, it's a house, it's a, as you said, traditional build. And, and absolutely, and, and for building the first one in the UK, we wanted to demonstrate that this is a very transferable technology. So everything above ground level is traditional prefab build. Any developer or any normal house builder could build with this technology. The intelligence on this scheme is a relationship between the wet dock and the camp out foundation and the tethering system which holds this building in place. So when the river rises, so in, in the event of a flood, the water will rise very gently and the basement area of this will become slowly inundated with water. Simultaneously, the front of the garden has a number of flood cells. Okay, this is what we can see in this model, these, yes. these sets. Yeah. So by the time the second flood cell has become inundated with water, the owners within this building should know that the building has started to rise. So it's an early warning system. So that's part of our philosophy which is called living with water. The building will then rise through its interaction with the River Thames and can, in the event of a severe flood, rise almost two and a half metres. So that is what we would class as a biblical event. It's a one in 100 year event plus 300 mil allowance for climate change plus a 300 mil tolerance for freeboard, which is the wave action of any water body moving across the surface. Right. These these elements in the garden as early warning systems are. Does this compromise the landscape in any way, or is this is this smart design as well? No, I mean in this diagram you can see it's got quite hard edges, but I think when um, we eventually re release some photographs by our client, who's a landscape architect. Um, this will become a lot more softer. The main premise here is to design the levels and to make clear definition between those heights so that when the water level gets to a certain point in proximity to the house, you as an individual have got this early warning system. Traditionally, we've built barriers where the water rises very, very slowly and you become unaware of what's happening beyond that and then it overflows and you're surprised. What we're trying to say to our occupants that live here is live more harmoniously with nature and respond when it tells you here's your cue that we are about to flood. It's a live project. It's almost finished. The client, um, we did the first flood test last September and um, that was with just the Canflote Foundation. Then all the frame, top part of the building was constructed and the client moved in their furniture and then we flooded the site again. And the reason we did that was to, you know, the client may decide to put a grand piano in one of the corners or a very heavy uh, bookcase. So the, the whole design is designed to be calibrated from time to time to allow for lifestyle choices. And then finally, the client moved in just before Christmas. So they were able to erect their Christmas tree. And so they enjoyed their first Christmas in the, in the house. And now, uh, as we have spring, 
and summer approaching the early plantings going in so come the end of summer hopefully then it will be bedded in a lot like the house has always been there. Well, if this isn't cutting-edge architecture, I don't know what is, quite frankly. Is it, is it something that we can see, expect to see more of in the future? No, absolutely. I mean, we've already got um, half a dozen houses all along the River Thames. Um, but we're already having inquiries from Holland. We've got a through pilot scheme potentially in Dordrecht. Uh, we're working uh, with their local council in a, an area which is called Nijmegen which if you know your World War II history, which is the bridge too far from Arnhem. So the site is very close to there. And then in Paris, we were asked to look at a very large site um, to give a, a, a quantum of scale. It's about eight times the size of the Olympic Park. And they've asked us to apply the life principles to plan that site to allow water in in a predetermined fashion. So that would have a combination of the three house types we've discussed before, the elevated, the flood resilient, and potentially some amphibious. So, we're, we're optimistic that schemes, through built examples, people will have more confidence that this is a viable solution. And hopefully, in a decade's time, this will just become a practice. It's very much part of future cities. And um, one thing's for sure, uh, we'll be hearing more from and about the backer architects uh, sure. with projects like this. And um... Well, thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at such a wonderful event. Richard, thank you very, very much.